welcome to Confectionery Live 2023. My name is Clay Gordon. I'm the technical editor of International Confectionery Magazine. And in this panel, I'm going to be presenting a holistic systems view towards sustainable packaging. One of the key issues that I think you need to know as a consumer of packaging is this notion of what is called EPR or extended producer responsibility. Now, this is a concept that is being more and more introduced into legislative and regulatory frameworks around the world. And according to the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, the OECD, the extended producer responsibility idea right, is that it's an environmental policy approach in which a producer's responsibility, and in this case, producer is a fairly extensive term. It could be a producer of packaging. It could be a consumer of packaging that produces, that produces a wrapped product, right, and it extends from the beginning of the supply chain all the way through, right, to the post-consumer stage of a product's lifestyle. A life cycle. So what that means is that you, as a consumer of packaging, are going to be responsible not only for how that packaging is produced, right, and waste streams and environmental conditions and all the thing, all the issues that are normally externalized that you don't normally think about as a producer, and that you also need to worry about what happens to your packaging, right, once it makes it into the consumer's hands. And so this is the framework going forward. Um, as with many of the legislative issues, uh, especially in front of the EU, um, this is going to be affecting very, very large companies first. Um, legislation is already being enacted if it hasn't already been enacted. Um, and big companies are uh, scrambling to make sure that they are going to meet their obligations under these regulatory frameworks. But uh, history shows us that over the course of the next five to 10 years, these requirements be, are going to be pushed down. Your responsibilities um, are going to be under these regulatory frameworks. The sooner you know about it and the longer you have to be able to consider how does it affect my particular situation, the better off you are. And that's the purpose of really um, today's discussion, that you want to take a holistic, long-term systems view to packaging, right? So when we talk about sustainability and package, packaging, what is it that we, we mean, right? So when definitions of sustainability are, tend to be fairly fungible. I mean, I'm, many companies will define sustainability in a way that makes sense to them as an organization. For example, there are 17 UN sustainable development goals, and the company will say, I'm only interested in four of those. And so I'm going to decide that I'm sustainable according to these four of the 17 SDGs, or it might be one or it might be 11. But sustainability, um, there is no um, industry-wide accepted definition for what sustainability means and what the requirements to be considered to be sustainable are. Um, this may change. I'm, I'm sure that there are regulatory efforts underway to provide this definition. And so keeping on top of them is something that I do recommend that, that people do. But sustainability um, involves more than just ensuring that the packaging materials themselves. So if you're buying a paper or you're buying a flexible film or some other material that you're using in part of your packaging, right? Sustainability is more than just, oh, there, this is claimed to be recyclable, or this is claimed to be sustainably produced, or this is claimed to be compostable, right? And so one of the things the research tells us is that there is a discrepancy, right, between items that are labeled sustainable, recyclable, or compostable, right? And those that actually end up being collected in a way that enables them to be recycled or composted. Uh, and it is this gap, right, that um, is a measure of the efficiency of the system. If 20% of the materials that are labeled as compostable are actually um, collected and then sent to a facility that can in fact compost these materials, you have a system which is fairly inefficient. And it is this discrepancy, right, that we, we want to be able to close the gap on. We want to make sure that as many of the materials that we purchase 
that we want to label as sustainable, recyclable, compostable are, are not only adhere to the regulatory definitions for what sustainable will mean, for what recyclable means, for what compostable means, but actually that it gets collected right, by us as organizations. So we have a responsibility for any waste right, or any unused product to be able to be able to send them to a third party collector who is going to do the recycling um, and the composting on our behalf if we don't actually have facilities internally to do things like home composting, for example, on a small scale. Right? But these are these are the issues which are being wrestled with um, in in large and in small around the globe, around the concept of sustainable packaging. So sustainability is more than just oh, I am purchasing a substrate, I am purchasing a film, I'm purchasing a, I'm, I'm purchasing a paper uh, product that is used in my packaging, and that particular uh, material that I'm purchasing is itself, quote-unquote, sustainable. Sustainability in the context of a holistic systems view of packaging is, in fact, this extended producer responsibility approach. How is my packaging produced? How is the materials produced? What happens to the packaging once it leaves my factory and once it is, in fact, used by the consumer? Right. So um, talking about that in a little more depth, we the, one of the terms that gets used, I use cradle to grave. Um, circularity is another way to think about that. Right. So circularity is the point to which something can be reused. So I, I, it, it, the raw materials are brought in. Um, it, it, those raw materials are transformed into a product. Then that product is, in fact, broken down, recycled, reused, um, and then converted into feedstock, for example, um, to create new materials or to create something else that, in fact, can then be reused. Um, much of that reuse, the discrepancy we're talking about, is because there are limited options for many items in terms of recapture. Um, for example, flexible film. Flexible films includes the kinds of single-use plastic bags that we might get at a, a store. The collection options, the recapture options for those flexible films are often limited to um, receptacles in stores. Um, there's no easy way for the consumer to be able to take a plastic bag and get it recycled, for example. And it is this circularity um, which is limited by this lack of recapture options. So in addition to the in-store and consumer, for example, my local municipality having a recycling collection um, option, right? Um, what happens is, is that there are usually um, third-party organizations, uh, companies who, who purchase or are given these materials, um, often purchase, um, and it's their job to be able to take the materials and to create a product that they can turn around and sell at a profit. So it'll pay for them for the investment in infrastructure to be able to do the transformation of these, for example, single use films into something that could be used for another process. And so these, uh, the ability to recapture and collect these things, as well as access to end markets, companies that are going to do this transformation, um, are in fact a limit to circularity. So very, very large companies will in fact not rely on municipal collection in order to take care of their internal recycling um, and recapture technologies. They will hire companies that specialize in this, um, and they will either come and pick it up or the company will go and deliver it to this third-party company um, it for, to make sure that the product that they are um, using, that the product they are not that is waste material from their own processes, um, are going to be um, captured and are going to be reprocessed into some other um, material, a feedstock, um, or a finished substrate that can be used again. And it is that limit, right, which determines the, the efficiency of the entire system. Um, and it turns out that in many places around the world, um, this, be, this is an issue. The, these opportunities for recapture and these end markets may not exist in a coordinated fashion. And even in a country like the United States, what you'll do is you'll find that if I'm a company and I have operations in multiple states, what I may find is that the infrastructure to 
capture and then to process the end markets is going to be different every place that um, I, I do business. And uh, so there is no easy, for the most part, one size fits all um, solution to be able to manage this for, for companies, right? In particular, because we're talking about confectionery and baking and things like that, composted food packaging items, often single use films that things are wrapped around, right, are huge challenges. Um, um, especially um, in composting, because the food will contaminate the material, and that makes it very, very difficult to recycle. Um, and even though, as a consumer, we are often told we need to rinse the plastic and cans and bottles before we put them into recycling, often that's not the case. We may not know that a food container, for example, which had a, a slice of pizza on it, um, even though it may be paper, there's oil from the from the cheese on the pizza, which has contaminated the paper, and therefore it may may not be recyclable um, because of the contamination with the food. This reduces the efficiency; it raises the costs of doing um, that recycling, and makes it much more difficult to achieve the kinds of sustainability um, end to end that are in fact um, our objectives. What's also coming on, um, in, which I think is a really, really interesting, um, is there a really interesting phenomenon, is that there is interest in replacing single-use films with papers that paper that is much uh, more easily recyclable than existing single-use films. Um, and this slide is DIYD, which is damned if you don't, and then damned if you do. The point being that even though there is broad support for replacing plastic, single-use plastics with paper items, which are supposed to be much more easily recyclable, it turns out that the revenue and profitability, the research shows, of many CPG firms, many of the largest CPG firms, and I'm going to um, uh, include the largest uh, candy confectionery um, and bakery uh, firms whose items are in grocery store shelves, right? They are in fact, completely dependent upon single-use plastics. Okay, uh, what's happened is is that you know the companies are being told that by a growing clamor of um, industry organizations, of uh, consumer groups, of individual consumers, that what they would like to see is they would like to see single-use plastics replaced by papers, right? Um, and they're going to be uh, paper or biopolymers, um, as opposed to petroleum-based products. Uh, the biopolymers should be easier to recycle than uh, petroleum-based products are. So even though they're they're sort of drawn by the siren call, right, from these groups, right, to make the transition from single-use petroleum-based plastics to other substrates and other films, um, the big plastic world. Right when these um, big companies do switch, right, actually go and try to um, um, lobby them um, by descending upon them, the, the companies who produce the packaging, um, their industry organization proxies who support the work that they're doing, all right, um, will descend on them and try to um, delegitimize what it is that they're doing or tell them that they're doing the wrong, they're doing the wrong thing. So this is. They are damned if they don't make these changes because one set of um, pressure groups is going to um, call for them to make the change and are going to publicly deride them, uh, maybe going into investor lawsuits to force them to do these things. And at the same time, very large companies who have been their suppliers for years, if not decades, are going to descend on them with another set of arguments saying, well, no, you really do need to keep the status quo the way it is. All right. So this is primarily an issue for very large companies. It is less of an issue for very, very small companies. There are a couple of reasons why this is the case. One of which is that if I'm a small, for example, craft chocolate maker, or I'm a local baker, the total impact of what it is that I'm going to be doing is not great. If I'm selling out of my own retail shops, I have more control. If when this gets into broader distribution, um, for example, into consumer grocery store, um, the volumes um, are much, much greater. The amount of money involved becomes much, much greater, and the pressures to either make the change or to resist the change become much, much greater 
as well. The important point here I would like to make is that you have a policy which addresses end-to-end um, so that when consumers come to you, your customers come to you, you can talk about what it is that you're doing and why it is that you're doing using more than just the word sustainable. Yes, for example, right, we have a composting um, capability. What we do is we collect all unused stuff, which could be compostable, and then we have a company and we go and compost it. If we have if we have um, film, um, for example, we're using a lot of plastic film to be able to cover things, um, for example, during rising of, of bakery goods, then there is a process by which we collect that film and make sure that it is uh, recycled appropriately where we possibly can. Not just saying, oh, yes, we recycle, but oh, yes, we work sustainably. We actually have a policy in place, and we can talk about the policy, and we can train our employees to be able to respond to consumer questions about what those policies are, rather than just using single word terms like sustainable, recyclable, compostable, right, to describe what it is that we're doing, right? right? This is the way you can respond to criticisms from for, that you might get to what it is that you're doing, right? So. Some of um, the current elements of sustainability when it comes to packaging and chocolate, right? Um, very, very large companies. Um, uh, I read some research uh, recently uh, that suggested that one of the largest uh, consumer confectionery companies um, is having challenges um, meeting its sustainability goals in this regard. Sustainability meaning a conversion from single-use films, which are very hard to recycle, to um, substrates that are much, much easier to recycle, um, is that they're having trouble making the changes because um, the availability of food-safe films is currently very, very constrained. Right? And this is an important thing. It's not just any film that we're looking for because this is going to come into contact with food. We need to make sure that it is food safe. Right? It's also really important to notice that some print finishing techniques may render an otherwise quote unquote sustainable substrate. So um, unrecyclable. So for example, I might have a paper, which is FSC for its stewardship cancel um, certified, right? In terms of the way the um, trees were harvested, but then I may use a finishing technique so, for example, I may use a petroleum spot varnish, um, which is UV um, cured, um, or I may use a, a gold or copper or silver foiling technique on top of that. And it may be that that foil um, is a material which makes the paper very, very difficult to recycle. So, as it, you know, ironically, you know, it is these foiling techniques that gives the impression of higher value of the product. Right? Just put gold foil on something and put it on a shelf and people, oh my gosh, this is a much more gourmet item all by itself. But it may turn out, if you're not careful, that that is counterproductive um, to a full 100% recyclable, um, sustainable packaging program. So it's really, really important that when you are discussing the packaging that you are purchasing, um, that you work with your print broker or you work with whoever it is um, you're um, securing the packaging through, that you understand how the print finishing techniques that you're using might affect the recyclability or the compostability of the packaging that you're producing. Right? Another thing that the research suggests is that, um, you know, I've looked at a lot of packaging and it's very, very rare for there to be recycling guidelines, how to recycle this um, um, package um, anywhere on the package. I mean, it's you know, if I'm a chocolate bar wrapper, for example, there's not a lot of room beyond what is already there and already legally required to be able to talk about um, how I might recycle or how I might compost. Where can I go to go find the information so that I, as a responsible consumer, don't necessarily just throw this into my rubbish tin, which is going to end up in a tip. If you have a sustainability claim that your client wants to make, um, figuring out, uh, determining how you might include that language, whether it's a symbol or however it might be done um, on the packaging, becomes something that more and more confectionery companies are looking at um, ways that they can reduce consumer confusion about how that can be done. And 
to be truthful, for smaller companies especially, um, this is not a priority other than perhaps putting the word sustainable or putting the word recyclable or putting the little symbol for recycling on their packaging, communicating about sustainability um, on their packaging is not actually a priority. And perhaps um, it's something that people should consider um, to be uh, a part of the language they use to communicate the ethics and the value proposition so that consumers could go, yes, I can feel good, uh, not just about the product that's inside the package. I love the way it tastes. You know, I, I love what it is that it does for me. Um, but also I can feel good about knowing that um, it is meant, the packaging is manufactured in such a way that it is in fact easy to recycle or that it is in fact home compost compostable as opposed to requiring to go to a composting facility in order to be composted. Um, there's a lot of confusion around that area, how long it takes to compost, things like that. Um, and uh, it might be a good I don't think it might be. I think it is going to become an increasingly important area of differentiation to consider when it comes to the whole notion of sustainable packaging for for companies at all levels. Um, as consumers become more and more um, um, aware of the need to do this, and as local regulations begin to require it. Um, so, for example, in New York City, mandatory composting um, is going to be implemented. Uh, it was. Uh, it was voluntary in the past, um, but the recent the recent rules that have been set forth in the five boroughs of New York suggest that composting um, is going to be mandatory in the near future. And so you, as a manufacturer, um, as a producer of packaging, need to help right, your customers understand whether or not your packaging, if it is compostable, is in fact home compostable and how it fits into the recycling requirements of local jurisdictions. So I wanted to end the presentation um, today when we talk about a holistic systems view, right, of um, packaging and sustainable packaging is to so is to put my futuristic looking glasses on and see some things that are being done now which are going to have uh, a profound effect i think over the course of the next um, several years some of these are things that only very very large companies are going to want to pay attention to and some of them may be things that smaller companies are going to be able to take a look at so the first one of which i think is very very interesting um, is that very large beverage companies uh, including alcohol companies are looking at replacing some of the glass bottles um, and plastic bottles that they're shipping their products in, in molded paper bottles. Now, the molded paper bottles um, do have a layer of a bioplastic inside, and it is formulated in such a way that the paper and the bioplastic do not need to be separated in order to be recycled. And obviously, the bioplastic on the inside, the film on the inside, provides the barrier that keeps the liquid seeping through into the paper. Um, the paper, the molded paper outer. So number one, it's using a uh, much more easily understandable recyclable stock. It's paper, right? Um, and it offers different packaging um, labeling opportunities on the outside. Um, so um, it, you know, this is something that um, there are currently trials going on. Very large companies are doing this um, as a way to reduce weight, um, as a way to reduce recycling burden. And it's really interesting to know that glass, along with aluminum cans, glass is one of the most recycled items out there. Um, but there are a lot of single-use plastic bottles that are out there. Water is one place where um, almost all of the water that is sold in bottles are sold in single-use plastic bottles. And so replacing the plastic with something which is uh, much, much harder to recycle. And as a general rule, less plastic is recycled than other uh, other forms of packaging um, is, is, is an innovation to take a look at. And if you are producing something that is liquid um, as one of your products, taking a look at a non-glass or non-plastic bottle could be an interesting, interesting opportunity for you. Um, so there are a lot of work that's being done right now in, in creating um, home compostable biopolymer films. Um, these films have applications that range um, from, you know, things like mailing envelopes to the way we would 
think a, uh, an existing single use film might be used uh, to wrap a loaf of bread, to cover a muffin. Um, it could be also used as a flow wrap um, to, um, or, in, or instead of a lipid tape um, BOPP bag um, for a, a bar of chocolate, uh, even to something like re refrigerated gel packs, which to me sounded really interesting because they, um, because of the, um, the water, um, rejection capabilities, the moisture rejection capabilities of films. Um, but most importantly, you know, home compostable biopolyfilms, so biopolymer films, which means if I have any plot of ground in the backyard, or if I have something like a Bokashi system where I'm composting um, in my kitchen, or in this particular case, New York, home compostable means I could put the film in with the compost in New York City um, with the rest of my food waste really, really interesting um, kinds of capabilities. And so I'm looking forward to these films. Often um, they're made as it goes, uh, often they're made um, with um, uh, uh, plant sources, um, which um, don't will not have a huge effect on the food supply chain as well, which is really interesting. Um, one thing that I think we're gonna see um, more and more of is um, there are people using innovation, preci innovative precision fermentation and other techniques to actually use carbon dioxide, which is captured um, out of the air and use it as a feedstock for the creation of new uh, materials. Um, and there are, was work being done to actually create a one-to-one -one replacement um, for PET plastic from carbon capture, right? And it is identical to PET. You can use it where and, and wherever petroleum-based PET is used. Um, and But however, it's contributing to a drawdown of um, atmospheric CO2. Really, really interesting uh, oppor uh, opportunity for very large companies to be able to look at their overall carbon footprint um, and see a way of reducing it by using an alternative feedstock, um, and which should have a um, a virtuous cycle. So the more of this that is used, the more carbon drop. It, it's it's a really, really interesting concept. And I'm looking forward to uh, keeping track of the developments in this area to see which big companies are going to be the first to adopt this technology. So one thing that I saw uh, when I was doing the research for this that I thought was really, really interesting is people are making single-use films that are not plastic, but they are, in fact, edible films. Um, and one of the applications was a stock cube. So what I would do is I could take a, a, a cube of stock, I would wrap it in this edible film, which might be made from something like pea protein, right? And I that and I could throw that into boiling hot water, right? And that um, the edible film um, would dissolve and it would not have an effect on either the taste or the texture of the finished product. I can imagine um, a bunch of confectionery products where this would be interesting. I could imagine um, using this to uh, microencapsulate some um, some powders to make them more easily miscible. Um, and but one of the places where I think it's going to be really really interesting would be, for example, if I had a a, a packet of hot cocoa mix that rather than having a multi-layer um, pouch, which I tore open, that what would happen is I could take that hot cocoa mix and just put it in the bottom of a, um, of a glass and either pour uh, milk or hot water, hot milk or hot water over the top of it. And um, there would be no waste. And I think that small kids especially would think it would be pretty cool. And I can imagine, well, you know, we, we don't want the Tide Pod um, to come back but you get the idea that there's going to be this whole range of new films that are in fact edible right and that are soluble in water and they're going to completely transform the kinds of products that we can create and the way that we distribute those products again these are probably for much larger companies um, but i could imagine that if you're a small company and you're purchasing any kind of pouch technology that you might be able to get these kinds of films and get these kinds of um, edible films and soluble films and be able to use them as you would in a conventional filling line um, a powder filling line um, to be able to create new products for consumers. I think it's a really, really interesting idea. Right? And with that, that's what I have to say about the concept of um, holistic system to you of sustainable packaging today. My name is Clay Gordon. I am the technical editor of International Confectionery Magazine, and I look forward to be able to answer your questions.